Hello, my channel mammals. Hi. I'm so I'm so glad you climbed up here with me. It's kind of fun to be up here, isn't it? Out of the way of everything. Um, I'm up here because I wanted to find a place where I could just talk to you alone. And so here we are. Um, I'm, I'm having a little bit of trouble just thinking how to begin. But I have a very important conversation to have with you today. Um, well, oh, let's see. Um, well, first of all, why don't I just repeat something I've told you before, but it bears repeating, which is, I appreciate you all so much. It's just been such a wonderful journey, getting to know you um, in the most full way, way beyond any objects or obstacles of, of body or anything, right to thought. How many conversations go all the way to the thought? It's, it's not just how do you do, it's, um, how do you think? <laughs> and it's, it's been such an adventure for me. So I just want to express gratitude once again. And I haven't been able to answer lately your comments, but I read every one and I'm wanting and am going to, I'm just going to answer. I've got to find a way. It's difficult, but I've got to find a way because every one I read, I just want to, I want to just holler right back. So, um, just know that I'm with you and I'm, I'm thinking about every single word. Well, anyway, the reason that I'm speaking to you today, there, there have been some rather strict comments lately. Only a few out of thousands and thousands. Just a handful of comments have been sort of severe. And before, they never were before at all. Only generous kindness and just nothing but, I don't know, the kindest, warmest, closest thoughts I've ever known. So it's not like it's, um, you know, an epidemic of harshness. It's just that I don't want one single of you to, to misunderstand truth. And I just, I feel like I just need to tell the truth so that everyone who's right here together right now can hear the truth and they can disregard it or they can do whatever they want to with it, but at least to know that they've honestly heard the truth. Um, I guess what it is, is, oh, well, let me give you some examples. Um, one comment was, um, oh, you can just, you know, be silly in your galley, um, playing with all your toys or something like that because you're so rich. And um, at first I thought they meant that in a compliment because I thought, oh, they know how rich I am. I just feel so rich. And I just feel the richness of, of, of substance all around me. But then I started to think that maybe they didn't think of it that way, that they were thinking of materialism. And that in that situation, they were mistaken. But another comment was, um, oh, this is just disgusting um, that you would ask um, people to contribute to Patreon when you're a billionaire. And another one, oh, they said, it's just disgusting they use that word that you would um, even be on Patreon and with all your billions. And they usually use the word billions. I don't know. I don't think they really mean that. But that's what they've been saying. And on, I think out of all the comments for, for forever, maybe five people have said something like that. And I want to speak to those five people because, and many, maybe many more who haven't spoken, I want you to know that I understand why you're saying what you're saying. And I, if it was true, I would agree with you. You know, I would agree, well, why would you need to have people contribute when you have something, you have the financial means to contribute? 
and and that this should be free <laughs> um, uh, and that this work that you're doing even and and that might be their perspective and point of view which is fine but I, I think that people should have their point of view based on fact and then they can have whatever point point of view they would like because you know it's a free country and and we want to you know accept all the different perspectives of things and um, so but what what is the problem there is that people don't really know the truth about something that happened a long time ago um, for Richard and me and um, when it first happened we we would always try to correct the thought and and always and first maybe I should go back to where where it was and I would love to tell you the whole story of how Mackenzie Childs began you would just love it I think but I think I'll save that for another video but for right now we just need to get down to business and get the business straight so that you you have the facts and then you have your own um, you know understanding and depth of understanding of business or lack of that but that doesn't matter it's it's not it's only what needs to be corrected is what is misspoken and then if you don't understand uh, or you assume I sh we should do things differently well that's just a difference of opinion and that's wonderful um, it doesn't even matter if it's right or wrong or we've tried it or we've done it or anything like that okay so the business it, it started in, in my in my studio um, and 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 soon after Richard was right there to support um, he had a, a job at a, a nearby school college and it was terribly very very low pay and we we needed to we needed to take care of our our family and so um, so the business began and in it, in it it didn't even have a name it just had Victoria and Richard Mackenzie Childs I mean we never named our business it just was what it was and so um, I'm trying to explain that um, as the business grew uh, we didn't really realize it was growing we were just working so hard to keep up with it and um, and we didn't understand or even maybe even want to believe that it would ever be different it never even occurred to us that somebody would want this business it was just our work how could anybody want to have one's other's work I mean it's it's impossible right at least in our way of thinking and um, so we didn't ever protect ourselves legally uh, you know with contracts and, and different manner of uh, setting up the structure so that we were quote unquote protected um, from any kind of loss it just didn't it just wasn't in our thought I know it might be hard for some of you who are so pragmatic and so clear about um, things like that but uh, our focus was on just giving and everything we had went back to our work because that was life to us and we loved it and it went to our our staff everything went right to them and we were paid also but it was so important that every need be taken care of and, you know insurance and all the different attitudes of things so we uh, we felt completely um, at, at one with all of that and then um, and then round about near the turn of the millennium just like at the turn of any century actually thought was being uh, agitated people were uncomfortable um, things were changing but they didn't know where or how um, there was a lot of invention which is typical also of an, a new era there was a lot of uh, confusion and fear of the unknown and I remember quite long before it actually came I was feeling this I could feel that the retail uh, businesses were kind of squabbling amongst themselves and, um, and 
and there was there was a sense of not enough or um, just hardship. And even though there wasn't hardship, there was a great abundance. Actually, uh, the world was looking like it was flourishing at that moment. But it, it was actually not on quite on a right basis. Possibly, I'm not a um, an economist, <laughs> but I just had that feeling, and it just was in my heart. And I I didn't know what to do about it, but I felt that retail was going to end somehow or diminish. Not, nobody would have agreed. Nobody. Even the top thinkers probably would have agreed at that point. Um, but I, I just had this strong feeling, and I think it's because our whole hearts were involved in creating an environment to invite the world in, to change and to um, jolt thought out of uh, old thought and to challenge thought and to bring out the humor and the life and um, the, the vigor and, and also just hidden secrets and all kinds of surprises were in our, in our thought all the time. And it was a glorious experience, but I just felt it being pulled out from under somehow. So then um, something did start happening. Uh, the bank that we, we had a wonderful CFO. I always trust. I trusted him. He, he was a trustworthy man. He was a good man, and, but I couldn't guide him, uh, because if you're not involved in the finance every day, I feel it's unwise to um, get involved in somebody else's interpretation of things, especially with all their knowledge and so forth. So. I just um, followed his sense of direction, and, and he, he felt we should change banks uh, to a local bank. And so we did that, and this bank, after some time, started to manage uh, their business not in a, in, a, in a way in line with the law, which was that you're not allowed to lend more money than is capable on the other end to be uh, renewed in, in, in a need of growth. And evidently, 40 other businesses in the state of New York were affected by this um, bank's action. And when we started to discover it, we found that all the bankers that we knew were gone. They disappeared. And so there were things going on where people were scattering. And so we found, we started to feel things strange all around us and slipping somehow and then we hired at the at the um, suggestion of a very fine thinker a consultant who could be he called himself a turnaround guy and he could help our our business adjust and steer correctly and it, it it's more complicated than I'm able to say in this just so you know um, I don't want it to be so simplified that it's just like we lost our business and here we are. <laughs> um, I want you to understand a little bit of what it felt like in the motion, but not so much to, you know, burden you because my goodness, it's not your need. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna get over this part. It looks like it's a sad story, but it has a glorious ending. So stay right with me here and you'll see what, what's happening. So then what happened was, um, this man came aboard, and at that time, we were starting to open up our thought to doing licensing because people were, uh, quote unquote, knocking off Mackenzie Childs all over the place by then. It took years and years for them to figure out how to do it. They actually didn't do it. They only did the superficial look of Mackenzie Childs, but it was happening everywhere. And we thought, well, maybe we just need to license and 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 let that the works of the past support the works of the new and let those licenses um, support that rather than just giving giving it to the world and and us constantly just feeding them with new <laughs> and and so um, we had several many actually offers of licensing it was very exciting I was starting to really enjoy 
the um, new adjustment in thought in that. Not that we would only license, but it would just be an adjunct. So one of them um, was uh, that uh, Le um, Leonard Lauder of Esther Lauder had got in touch with me and wanted to know if we would design a perfume and a bottle. And I thought, oh, what a thrilling idea. And it's not something we would do at the studio, so it wouldn't interrupt any of our work there. It would only, you know, just bless everybody. And so that conversation started to mature. And then there was a, a contract. And, um, but there were others too. And we wondered why we'd never heard from anybody. And then one night, Richard and I were walking around the studio and we happened to walk in the, the office where this man was working and we looked in the rubbish bin, not even on purpose. It just caught my eye and there was the contract from Leonard Lauder. And um, we, we approached this man about it and the others and he said that the company value needed to diminish in order to sell it. And I said, sell it? What do you mean? And um, I couldn't, he wouldn't answer. He said, you have to have to be open about all the options. That's my expertise. And we also couldn't let go of that man because he had a very, very severe contract that we would never be able to afford to get out of. So my friends, I, I was starting to feel pinched in this situation. I wasn't really on top of it. And we also noticed the harshest part of all for us was that as we'd walk around the studio, as we always did, and stop and meet with people and critique as we went or just express gratitude or whatever it was that was needed that day, it, you know, just normal business, the people were kind of looking past us or to off to the side and they weren't really listening and they weren't really responding except in a sort of feeling of a superficial way just to be uh, polite but we could feel that something was odd and we found out years later that all the people in the studio were told not to respond to us if we made any suggestions or any direction we found that out later. So then one day, Richard and I were, as usual, working at the studio. It was a Friday morning and a car drove up. You know, it might have been a Saturday. I'm not sure because I don't remember very many people being around, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> That's little details you don't need to bother with. <laughs> anyway. It was somebody with some other people in the car with them. And they drove up and rolled down their window and said, this company, Mackenzie Childs, isn't yours anymore. And you must leave now. And it was very stark. My, I, I, I felt a physical reaction. <laughs> You know, it's not good when you feel a physical reaction because you need to handle all reactions and keep them in their place and in their pers perspective. That's just a little hint from experience. <laughs> so anyway, they took everything. People think that, um, well, they took everything. In fact, they even took our car and Richard and I had to walk home with our very heavy hearts that day, seven and a half miles up Pumpkin Hill. And it was quite a burden, I'm telling you. <laughs> we really carried it heavily for that moment. But, you know, um, we weren't overcome. You know, we weren't overcome because of prayer, because we knew that nothing that was truly ours could ever be taken from us because we are God's and God is all. 
and we are God's expression and nothing of God, nothing of good can be gone. And so there is that fiber that was holding us upright somehow, but it was on, on the very outside of human body, there was a feeling of uh, burden. And um, anyway, here's what I think is important for you to know. Well, when all this first happened, well, first of all, the company was not sold. We did not sell the company. Um, we did not receive any remuneration from the company, not a penny. And we also, um, they tried to, you know, take away our, our very being. They even replaced us with um, some people, I think, I, I didn't ever watch this, but people would go on tour and people who didn't know actually thought that they were me <laughs> speaking to them. And so there was, there were funny little things like that, not funny, but strange things, uh, unbelievable things, unfathomable things that were going on that, I mean, there was nothing, I mean, what else, what could, what should you do with that? Well, in the midst of that, people would meet us, you know, still, we still were, had legs and were walking around <laughs> here and there. And, um, oh, but well, let me just back up for a moment. Um, I mean, this is really important, actually. I have a smile on my face, but I have a deep joy in my heart. And that is that on the day that we were packing up our things, you know, our backpacks to go, one of the fellows from the studio so sweetly came over and he brought some brownies over that he had made. And he said, I just wanted to try to reach out and give our love to you whilst you're packing up. And so I kind of, I kind of joked for a moment. I said, oh, this is bizarre, isn't it? it, it I've never been to a funeral before. But I know that people have feasts sometimes at funerals, and it's like being at our own funeral. <laughs> and it sounds strange, but it was just a human way. I, don't, I didn't even think what I was saying. But then what came to me was there's no death. It's the first time in my whole being that I even pondered that question. But I realized that there is no such thing as death. Because this was like a death experience. Imagine your, your name, your presence, your contact with other people, your whole world, everything that you had brought to make a world better, hopefully, was stripped away. Everything um, everything, the whole concept, the whole thought, the, actually what was behind the work, everything was stripped as if it was dead. Well, people, we would see people, places, and um, they would say, oh, we just love your work. We love Mackenzie Childs. Oh, we just love it so much. And and some people would say, oh, I just bought the, the slippers that you just designed. And I would think, what, what slippers? And there were things like that that were kind of added in, you know, um, into the mix. <laughs> and and we, we always felt we needed to explain, oh, I'm sorry, but we don't really have anything to do with Mackenzie Childs anymore. We don't own it. It's owned by a company. And, um, and and the people got very sad or they would just drop their heads or they would just turn away or they would just continue on like they didn't even hear it saying, oh, we just love the thing and oh, the new frog lid and the whatever, and, uh, the, the, you know, I don't know, the ladybug or I don't know what, just things that they would mention and they would just carry on with that. And so 
we after a while we saw that these conversations would just wither and and they would just become um, everybody felt awkward and we thought you know this isn't ours to do we don't need to change to correct thought it, it, it's up to it, it we just should let go and just let people you know when when you're little and somebody compliments you on your dress and um, your mother tells you don't say oh this is just my not my favorite dress my mummy made me wear it <laughs> or whatever <laughs> um, but to just say thank you when people compliment you just say thank you because they're not complimenting personally you or your taste or your thought they're thinking from their own perspective and they're sharing love they're really thinking about love and so I thought, okay, when people compliment us, we just gracefully say, thank you. And we just let it go like that. But you see, I understand how um, venture capitalism works, I think. I've never known much, but I understand that they have to take things quickly, sharply. They have to keep the staff in having hopes and, and having a belief that it's going to be better and better not just a belief but a promise you know they, they have their own trust in their own contribution of finance and business plan and so forth and so they must act quickly and get rid of um, whatever was up before so that the people could feel the, the newness and the trust in that and shift very quickly so I, I understand that so well and um, we even, or it was even suggested that we start to do our new work, you know, new ideas, which was every day for us, you know, it wasn't even hard. And so we did, um, under just not using our, our full names and so forth. And, and then, um, on the retail side, um, there are very few, uh, fine shops in, in the world and fewer and fewer was happening at that time because of the dot-com world coming into business into being and so um and that was shut off from us because of the threat that they would lose the original you know collection and so wherever we turned it was just a door it seemed but um and so i wanted you to know that we never intentionally uh, abided a lie but we just didn't try to fuss over the details of business anymore and so people like you maybe some of you maybe most of you think we sold the company and we were billionaires <laughs> and we they may even many people think we're still there and they think that we're getting royalties and I mean they must think that we're just on top of the world in the of the material world and um, so that's why I can see that the people who were upset about us having part of Patreon, where, you know, it's, it's a, a wonderful concept, really, where people are allowed to give whatever they like. It's not like crowdfunding, where you have a special project and you get a gob of funding for that special project. And you, um, in this, it's for people who just want to nurture and support a developing idea and wanting those who are doing the business of supporting that idea of making that of keeping it going to support them and in the basics of um, um, of so that they can have a sense that there's almost like a salary you know a monthly salary uh, just to keep them uh, uh, supported from behind as a focus to, to endure what they're enduring uh, for the good of so many, which is a beautiful thought. And so those who thought we were very, very, very wealthy, um, they thought it was kind of rude that we would uh, open the Patreon account <coughs> when we had more money than anybody in the world, or even a few, many thousands of dollars. And so... I understand that because they're basing their judgment on a sense of righteousness. 
They want things to be fair and just and loving and generous. And I thought, those are good qualities. And I never took it personally, even though when I saw those <coughs> comments, at first I felt, I felt bad. I felt bad for them because there wasn't any means or way except the rumor mill, you know, for them to feel confidence that they were right about this. And I felt now is the time that we must, we must know, let everybody know that what you're collecting from Mackenzie Childs, the company, um, is never, it, it is, it, if you love it, it is rich with, ben, for your, ben, uh, you know, for your inheritance, for your children, your grandchildren, for, for the world, it endures. If you love an idea, you cannot lose anything. There is no loss. And, um, and, and that we wish no harm. We have no bitterness. In fact, we have liberty. We have love and we have, we just have a substance that is indestructible. And, 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 we, and we are not, you needn't be worried for us. Um, we are just amazing. We, I feel like Davy Crockett. You know, he didn't care whether he, his shirt got ripped and he just kept plowing through the jungle, through the forests, foraging forward finding America, you know, developing it, caring about it, speaking to the public, making things break open, leading. I, I just think he didn't worry about um, if he had the latest fashion. He just kept mending what he had and just kept going. And I, I just think that is the American dream and he is blessed by it. He died in the Alamo, a noble death. But that man and many, many others in our, our beautiful story before us have done great wonders. And we certainly have the wherewithal to continue on in that way. And we don't have to have any name, any personality, anything of matter. We just have to be what we are and we can't avoid being like all of us just beams of light you know it says ye are the light of the world and whatever it lands on is a different color or a different object that comes to light um, a different re re reflection it's so exciting and there's enough for infinite room for everybody to express and also those to tend things on a more um, uh, pragmatic level, and all of those details are all part of that light. I realized back to that idea of there is no death. I remember that first day um, when we got home, oh my goodness, it felt so lonely. It felt so hollow. It felt so strange to just be standing there. And it, it was the shock. And I thought, that, that's, that's the fear of death. And um, that's the belief where we may feel we have nothing of anything of the past. We have no other associations. And, um, and so we feel like we might have passed on. But then you realize that our life is not about matter. Matter, matter doesn't matter. I used to always say that, but it's easy to say that when there's matter all around you, right? <laughs> and objects being made and sent out to the world. <laughs> but when you have nothing and it all has gone, to say that means you believe it. And I loved believing it. I always loved that. So I realized that there is no death. It's just if things change in the material sense, you might feel if you were linked to that, if you were chained to that, 
that you might feel that you fell away with that. But no, our substance is indestructible. And our being is right here, ever, ever evolving, ever express, ever moving forward. And, um, and I, that's how I feel and have felt ever since. And, and so that's why people think we're rich, <laughs> I think, because they see this courage and this life and this hope and this dream and this, this, this idea that's just, just ebullient and bubbling forth everywhere. It's not coming from us. It's coming to us. And we're just reflecting it. <laughs> and, but it could be a mistake sometimes where people think, oh, they must be very rich so that they can just play all day. So it's so understandable that that could, could be a thought. But here it is corrected now. Um, um, and, and you know what? Here's the happy ending. <laughs> and it's not an ending, of course, because life is not linear. It's eternal. <laughs> it's ever my, my favorite mistaken word that I made up when I was speaking once too quickly. It's ever evolving. <laughs> and I meant to say ever evolving, but I spoke so fast it turned into a whirlwind. <laughs> and so now I use it all the time. <laughs> but um, so um, here's what it is. Here's what is happening right before us. Do you realize that we are thousands and thousands and thousands of people gathered together every minute of every day somewhere somehow we are connecting people are watching these videos people are responding to these videos we are responding back to those responses we are building thought to a higher and higher and higher consciousness above the stars with the stars with the birds that's where we're going yes that's where we're going <laughs> There's little birds going past in front of me right here. <laughs> but um, we, Mackenzie Childs, is, is alive and well in all different levels. And um, that doesn't even matter. It really doesn't matter. God is everywhere. <laughs> and we are gods. And we are one... Um, and, and even if, if, if we don't speak of God, which might be a good idea, sometimes I, I don't really like to, you know, be pedantic or preach about anything. It doesn't even matter. We, we are all in, at one. <laughs> and we're, 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 we're progressing. Ideas are progressing. And, and Patreon is not hurting. It is a blessing, actually. It's a wonderful blessing. It's for the giver. It's a wonderful opportunity to be a part of the surge forward. To the receiver, it's it's just a lovely um, boost to keep going. It's a hope. It's it's taking care of some basic needs, very basic. One of the comments was, "Come on, you didn't just." be able to get a microphone because of Patreon. But <laughs> anyway, we don't need to go back to that. But we are just very, very grateful. And I, I love the idea. I'm just going to say one little thing about it. I especially love the idea that it's not a big, scary thing. You can go on Patreon and you can say, I would like to give a, a dollar a month. And you can just do it for one month. You don't have to even do it for any other time if you don't want to. Uh, you could give five dollars you could do 10 or 15 20. you could give nine dollars and 90 cents which somebody did you could do ten dollars and nine cents which somebody else did i mean it's so fun i don't know how it happened maybe because foreign countries uh, other people are are finding out maybe the currency exchange i'm not sure it doesn't even matter maybe they did it just for fun and just to say this is my particular contribution <laughs> and it's it's going to be a support. We we might be able to fix our our building, the, the school, which desperately needs out. We 
we might be able to even make product. I mean, there's no, all the things that all of you, everybody is in, enjoying in, in imagination can become real. And I love the idea that the giver doesn't have to feel it. Like, it's like maybe an ice cream cone worth a, a per month. Or, um, and, the, and the receiver can feel the abundance of love and hope and practical needs. The sun's coming out now. You know what I was doing? I was just thinking that um, last night after dinner, we sang a hymn that had a, a lot of what it took for, uh, for Richard and me to overcome this uh, belief of lack and, um, and turn, turn our thought towards the abundance that's before us, which we're seeing now. It, let me see if I can remember this one section. It goes, um, mm -hmm. oh, make me glad for every scalding tear, for hope deferred in gratitude disdain, wait and love more for every hate and fear, no ill, since God is good and loss is gain. Fear, no ill, since God is good and loss is gain. Isn't that perfect? And another thing that I just want to tell you before I say goodbye to you, and if you have any questions, of course you can always ask, but I think it's enough information now to, to understand. But this one is, is a great little story. Um, I don't even remember where I learned it, whether it was in Sunday school or from my parents or from somebody else along my way. They said, um, gratitude is riches. Complaint is poverty. So we'll remember that and <clears throat> off we go, onward. <laughs> and now I have to get downward. <laughs> <laughs>